you up to 30 <laughs> seconds like a freaking psycho. Like you think this guy, I've I'm changed. glad he's over the ball because otherwise he's going to be out. You know, My checklist is like, much <laughs> shorter now. It is. I, I, heard, you, I heard you're working on it, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The process. He is yeah. working on uh, his process. You've heard about the process. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. So would you, <laughs> would you say, but do you, do you do that or do you just, you like just swing athletically and just do it? The athletic tendencies take over. I, I am as maniacal about the game of golf uh, as Jason is, just in terms of, like, I know there's always something to work on and get better, and there's, I, I'm creative in that mindset where, you know, every little detail kind of matters, and I have to really try to turn all those thoughts off because it will get the best of you, especially I've been playing, selfishly, I've been playing the best golf of my life, and so it's like, how good can I really yeah. Dude, you were this summer. You were on fire. You're a scratch, are you? I got to the other side of that. I'm like a plus two right now, which is insane. And how old are you? You're you're 35. 35. Okay, Crazy. so you have 15 years before the Champions Tour if you want it. <laughs> if you want it. So yeah. 15 more years of training, you could uh, you could be unstoppable on the Champions Tour if you want to do that at 50, right? You can make that decision. That is then. that is a goal for sure. I, I know there's a. Uh, in the golf world, there's a lot of, you know, there are celebrity and pro-am stuff, and so you can scratch the competitive itch here and there, uh, especially when I get the nine months of my basketball season back when it's all said and done. Um, but, uh, yeah, Champions Tour, I mean, I'm sick. Like, basketball could be on. I, I might have that on my phone, but on TV, it's golf show. Yes, you and me both. It's just a problem. <laughs> My wife thinks I'm such an idiot. Well, you know that the, <laughs> the other night, a lot Jay, of apologies. Jason was over, and I showed him my golf channel, which was This Old House on PBS. I still watch This Old House. Do you know you know that show? I know that. Oh, it's no. like a, it's like from the 1970s. It's still on it. They they do they build homes. They build houses. Uh, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 really you know who likes it people who are in comas they play right. just to have so that they know that there's or or people that just can't they, just, they can't roll a TV into a room if something's in a coma and they can't find the remote control those they are the folks that love yeah, that yeah if the remote is broken it's on yeah, yeah, yeah. they're strapped to a chair and it's stuck on PBS yeah, it's the best show that Phil has I sent Jason a video this morning uh, and Jason's game has gotten so good mine is I don't I haven't been playing as much but but he's, not a plus. he's games, you're not a plus but your game's good. I sent this video today of this dude who played 18 holes with a 5-iron this yeah, morning. Yeah, and all he wanted to do was break 80, and he shot, what did he shoot, 76? He, 77? Yeah, he shot yeah. 78. Yeah, what? With a 5-iron. Yeah. yeah, he plays on the he plays on the DP Tour, a European guy. He did, that he tells was, you how good those guys are. Yeah. Two yeah. Bunk, he's hit two greenside bunker shots, yeah. flop shots. With a 5-iron. With iron. a 5-iron, dude. Yeah, it was Pretty good. crazy. We'll send it to you. Um, talk to me about you and Clay Thompson, the Splash Brothers. How did you develop the, 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 the chemistry with him? Is that is that you know when anyone's ever asked me about chemistry with with an actor or something like that, that it I always say, well, it, it's not something you want. It's just that person's just nice. It's just it's easy. If someone's not a prick, you you can get along with them and you yeah. have chemistry immediately. Yeah, is that, that is, is that as simple as it is with you and Clay? Transfer what it is to our relationship for sure. Like we. I've <clears throat> uh, been together on the court now for 12 years, uh, and then you yeah, add Draymond Green to that, we uh, for 11. So it's it's insane to think that two you know guys who've had who had uh, dads that played in the NBA as well. That's what I was gonna say. And yeah. like you said, have a good perspective about what we worked for to get here, and you know approach life very similarly with appreciation and gratitude that we kind of hit it off from the jump and. I don't know, like when you get into these type of friendships, and uh, you know, from your standpoint with your, your uh, people in the same profession, you know, yeah. comics, whatever, actors, that that you kind of sharpen each other's skill sets just by being around each other. Yeah, for and sure. That's how we've been um, this entire time. It's not something that we actually like really talk about. It's like, yeah, uh, you know, we don't come in and sit down at dinner, all right? What percentage are you trying to shoot this year? And, all right, what's your how, is your elbow at ninety degrees or what? It, it, but it's more just when we're in that environment. Um, our work ethics are pretty, uh, you know, top notch in terms of you know, being out able to try to figure out how to get better every single year. And that that, that iron sharpens iron is real. And yeah. there's such a respect level for uh, the way that he approaches basketball and life. And um, that's why we're still doing. And I'll bet the two of you with with that kind of harmony and kindness and quiet leadership and all that stuff, it's infectious in the team, correct? Like, you guys, I bet, have created a culture over there 
that it should be no surprise that you guys have won that extra 10 to 15 games each year, uh, whatever it takes to, to get to a place where you're in the finals. And once you're in the finals, like that kind of harmony in a team environment really yields the, the extra thing that you need to be excellent as opposed to great. Yes? No, for sure. The culture part of a lot of different ways to lead, right? There's a lot of different ways. You can be the loud one that needs to say something about everything. You can be the lead by example type. Um, you can be the ones that show up when the lights are brightest and, and galvanize that confidence within the team. Uh, but following kind of Steve Kerr, our coach, um, yeah. and the coach, the legendary coach that he played for, Phil Jackson, Greg Popovich, played you know, alongside Mike Kerr. has been famously a really, really nice guy. Yeah, he's just a great manager of people, like a personal guy. He, he seems to have a very sort of similar disposition, but I've seen very different personality, but different dispositions of Greg Popovich, both of whom I don't know at all. But it just seems <laughs> like yeah. they, have, they have a very similar kind of vibe. Is that, is that right? They're straight shooters. Uh, they have a great sense of humor. Yeah. They have uh, a, a perspective that there are problems in the NBA. They're they're real. Like, we're trying to win at the highest level. There's, there's pressure. There's, this is a multi-billion dollar industry that is uh, set up to test you in all different ways. And if you want to win at the highest level, it's going to demand a lot from you. But, you know, he has a, a great way of kind of explaining, like, we're blessed, man. We get to play basketball for a living, and, and he reminds us of that every single day when we come in. And that kind of just levels the playing field, and his level of trust within each other. And, and he does the best job of when you come into a, a team kind of element. I don't care if it's sports, it's whatever facet of life. Like everybody has a specific role to play, and he makes sure that that's clear. But it doesn't diminish your value to the success of everyone. And I think right. he has a great way of managing that process of you know, from day one to the end that's cool. making guys believe in that to you know that's why we have been uh, able to sustain this level of success but what do you what do you guys do season to season I, I, I always wonder like you come in you got you win a, a few championships and so you're the best you guys are the best you've got a, an unbelievable team you've got a great chemistry what does a guy like Steve Kerr say when you come into camp whatever that is August September to get ready for the new season do guys like him go, okay, well, we won last year. This year our approach is going to be. Because obviously the goal, like, if he sat there and goes, we want to win a championship. Like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wants to win a championship. Does he, do they set different goals? They go, this is, this is what we're going to do this year. Our approach is going to be different. Like, Yeah, there's a, the way I talk about what's happening right now. Like, we've won four championships uh, since 2015. We've been in six finals. We've lost two of them. Uh, we lost in the second round last year to, to the Lakers uh, on a down year for us, which is that's how the high standard we've set. Yeah. Came into this year, and to your point, like obviously everybody knows if we don't win a championship, then it's a failed season for us because of the standard. Cool. You can't just come in and say that. Like There has to be uh, a level of detail in how you approach the year. For us, it's we have to win the week. That's what we call it. So however many games there are that week, gives you a singular focus on what you need to do to win the week. We need to have a winning record every week. And um, that's how you get the like little bite-sized um, you know, motivation for a nine-month journey that there are so many emotional roller coaster you know, rides throughout the year. And uh, I think everybody, you want those little bit of celebratory moments, right? Whether you, you know you're going to hit some down, some, some tough parts of the season, some tough stretches, but Oh, you go two and one in a three-game week, and everybody's like, "Yeah, we, we did that." Like for a team that's won four championships, that might sound weird, but it's it's real because it keeps you in the fight. And uh, that that was the way he came in for this year. For somebody who for somebody who doesn't uh, watch sports, basketball, nothing, but they they're constantly striving to be the best that they can be and and be excellent as much as they can and. That they might struggle sometimes with the moment um, when it's time to, to go to, to you know hit the shot land the plane um, what, what what would what what would you tell without getting too woo-woo but is there is there something that you can uh, say to the listener for them to maybe focus on that might get them centered and focused so that they've got their best chance at being the best part of themselves like would you 
you focus on anything that's kind of evergreen? Don't fuck up. <laughs> I think that one is good. That's a great bumper <laughs> sticker. <laughs> Nike was going to do that one originally. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Before you just do it, they, 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 it was taken. Was yeah. gonna, don't fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because I guess, I mean, like you said, you know, I don't want to sound too cliche with it, but it's literally like confidence is built off your pre preparation. And, yeah. and that's first and foremost. And if you can't look yourself in the mirror and say you did everything that you knew and within your control to put yourself in a position to prepare for whatever that moment is, then you're already in, you know, you're already behind the eight ball. But then at that point, for me, the biggest hurdle that I had to overcome was like the legit fear of failure. It was yeah. legit, like sometimes wanting to hide from you know the backlash or the criticism or the, the the negative energy that you'll get if you don't accomplish whatever you set it out to do. Um, and once you go through that and put yourself out there, and you realize it's not all that bad. Because, yeah. yeah. Um, that's kind of what life is about, right? I'm going to do I'm gonna do boo boo for just one second because to that point, I would say the greatest safety net in anybody's life is the fact that you're loved, right? Yeah. So if you know you are loved and you feel you are loved by your husband, your wife, your kids, your family, your friends, your, your teachers, your whoever, your coach, you are loved. So if you are loved, you can fail a million times and still have that love to fall back on. But they're, yeah. they're always be there to catch you. Well, that's the challenge too there, probably, yeah. Make sure you have that sort of orphan. All the orphans just got that thing like screwed. Fucking dick. 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 I think focusing on that old jokes aside, I, I, I know, man, I have, and I can say, well, especially in the profession that we're in, uh, Jason started younger, and so, but he also knows what it's like, and I mean, I failed so much that I can't, all I did was fail for years, I didn't make Listen, can, we're all nodding. We're all I, nodding. Yeah, I know. We all are <laughs> nodding because it's true. And I continue to do it. And I failed from the time I moved to New York. I was 20. I didn't make it. I was so broke. And I just didn't. And I failed all the freaking time. And then there's that turning point. I was talking to my buddy Eli about it. <clears throat> that turning point where, I, you know, whenever it's just plays, you start to get better at it. You start to get better at it. You start to get better. And then you also, I think you develop a... Because we, I think as humans, we just naturally, we can, well, we can have 95% of our life is working great. And I'm with us here on Cooking for Yummies today. The time goes so quickly. It's a raunchy, campy musical, and it's a balance act for the actors, hitting that sweet spot of being funny, but also sincere. You want to be funny, but the funniest thing you can do is play it absolutely straight. Jill Owen plays John Kramer, a.k.a. Jigsaw, and Amanda Young, a rare survivor of one of Jigsaw's traps. In her role as Amanda, Owen strikes that balance between being over the top and being serious. It's gravy right. You know, you can pour gravy over almost anything. But my personal favorite, I really like a good mac and cheese. I like a creamy, creamy mac and cheese. And I know, I know a lot of chefs are going to cringe out there, but I love Velveeta as face. It is so creamy and so rich, and it just melts so well, but it's so simple and kid-friendly as well. I'm a big fan of mac and cheese. The kid in me comes out when I think about it. Whatever rings your bell, that's the thing. We urge people to experiment a little bit, to try different things, try different cheeses. Before we leave, I also wanted to ask Chef Aaron a little bit more about the Simple Truth brand at Kroger, and I know it's not macaroni and cheese, as we've just been talking about, but there are all kinds of options there from the very basic food products to also the Simple Truth, so you have kind of a wide range there at Kroger, correct? Yeah, but there is enough items on the shelves from Simple Truth to be able to make a good mac and cheese. Mm. As you mentioned, every family has their different traditions and different recipes to where I 
see a lot of tradition still alive in my wife's family. And on the other side, you have people like myself or my sister pushing my parents into doing new traditions. So there's a balance that you need to find with those things. And the simple truth makes that kind of nice because I feel like a lot of traditions in the past were heavy in calories, which there's nothing wrong with. But with simple truth, you can kind of start choosing more natural items, maybe the items that are a little bit better for you. Maybe a noodle that has some vegetables in it versus just a enriched white flour pasta. There's definite options out there and the simple truth, the simple truth product makes it available. And the other thing is, is as the cook or the chef, it's kind of fun to sneak that in there and know that you're giving them something maybe a little healthier and they don't even know the difference, which is really great. Well, Chef Aaron, thank you again. If we don't speak sooner, I wish you very happy holidays. We love having you here on Cooking for Yummies. Thanks again. Thank you very much. You can find out more of Chef Aaron Neiman's work at Kroger.com. Look under recipes. Thanks for joining us today for Cooking for Yummies, a presentation of WMKV, WLHS, and WMKVFM.org. Until next time, healthy and happy cooking. Stay tuned to WMKV and WLHS coming up soon. We will have the Local 12 News at 6. And, uh, that will be shortly, straight away. Let's go ahead and take a look. Maybe I can get a quick traffic in real quick. See how things are going on the roads. Uh, looks like we're already getting into it. I'll be back with traffic in a little bit. Authorities want you to know about it and what they're doing to stop the increase in youth violence. Let it fall. I don't care what's right or wrong. A local man has issues with his neighbors and the local police. What he's accused of doing and how it's attracting attention. I was told after my third treatment, this is not going to be, I mean, you're going to need to look at the next thing and soon. A man searches for a new treatment when he learns his cancer therapy is no longer working. The obstacle he faces and how he is not alone in this fight to find a shot at survival. This is Local 12 News, live at 6. Breaking news alerts and the weather authority forecast. This is Local 12 News. Good evening, I'm Paula Tony. And I'm Kyle Linsky. Federal agents now say the gun used to kill an 11-year-old in the West End earlier this month in a mass shooting there was probably a pistol modified to become a machine gun. Devices known as Glock switches are becoming an increasing danger in the community. Local 12's James Pilcher talked to the area's top federal prosecutor on how authorities are working to remove the threat. It's an exclusive interview you will see only here on Local 12. U.S. Attorney Ken Parker with the Southern District of Ohio told me today his office is aggressively prosecuting anyone found with one of these devices, which can allow a normal handgun to spray 30 bullets in about two seconds. It's an issue he says could be also fueling the surge in youth violence here in Cincinnati. These Glock or Giggle switches stop a trigger from pulling one shot at a time, allowing someone to empty a full magazine of 30 to 50 rounds or more in just a few seconds. Here's a demonstration done by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives earlier this year. U.S. Attorney Ken Parker says he's concerned about how easily juveniles can get them. Any young person with a gun is dangerous. You take a young person and you put a gun with a Glock switch in their hands, um, their level of dangerousness goes out the window. And we, we just can't have that. ATF agents say such a device was probably used on the gun used in the mass shooting in the West End earlier this month that wounded five and killed 11-year-old Dominique Davis and possibly used in other recent Cincinnati shootings. Do we have every reason to believe that a machine gun conversion device was used during the incident? Cincinnati police have yet to make an arrest in that case and declined comment given the ongoing investigation. The ATF last week issued a $5,000 reward for information that leads to a conviction. ATF agents and Parker can't quantify how many Glock switches they've seized in recent months, but say it's a growing danger. You've said how dangerous these are. What are you, as the top federal prosecutor, doing to take these off the street? I would like our prosecutors to look at each and every case where uh, Glock switches are involved and assess that particular uh, case, that individual for prosecution. So we're taking them very serious. We're not going to uh, 
give individuals a pass on the on having these these items. Uh, we're going to hold them accountable. Indeed, Parker's office secured two convictions for possessing the devices just in the last month. Just possessing that item, you're possessing uh, a machine gun. Um, they're nothing to play with. So, a couple of more points here. The devices can actually be made at home on a 3D printer, presenting even more problems to law enforcement, and newer versions are flatter and harder to detect, making them even more dangerous. If you're a parent, U.S. Attorney Parker wants you to research what they look like so you know how dangerous they are if you find one in, with your kids or in your friend's, kids' friends' possessions. Uh, back to you guys. All right, thank you, James. In addition to those two prosecutions in the last month, the ATF has charged another Another 11 people in federal court with possessing or helping to make and distribute the switches here in Cincinnati. The agency says more cases are in the works. Those convicted of possess possessing this device face up to 10 years in federal prison, three years of supervised probation, and a $250,000 fine. The man will stand trial for a quadruple murder once his case heard by a three-judge panel. Gurpreet Singh was tried once for the murders of his wife, her parents, and her aunt. That trial ended in a hung jury. All four victims were shot to death in 2019 in the couple's Westchester apartment. Singh's new trial is scheduled to begin April 29th. Live ammunition is found on a student at Lakota West Freshman School, prompting a lockdown for a time today. The lockdown was issued after the school got a tip from the Ohio School Safety Tip Line. The anonymous message said that a student on campus may be armed. While no gun was found, the student did have ammunition. That student may now face charges in addition to disciplinary action. All students and staff were safe and school let out at its regular time. Well, the weather this week is very important because a lot of you probably are planning to travel for the Thanksgiving holiday. Today was a good day if you had to get out. Well, yeah. that some things are I mean, leave it early. I had to open the umbrella for a second, but that wasn't bad, John. Yeah, a little bit of rain out there, but it wasn't bad. Tomorrow morning, though, things are going to change as heavier rainfall begins to make a move on the tri-state. Tonight, it's light, and it's pushing east of Cincinnati, out through Owensville, Batavia, some showers up around Wilmington, out to Hillsborough now, and a few showers down here around West Union, Winchester, and Peebles. Most of this rain is going to push out for the early evening, but there's another batch in southern Illinois that's going to make its way up the Ohio river and in here by late this evening all this part of a massive storm system developing back north south and west severe weather now in sections of louisiana and mississippi from that storm system and it's going to have some major impacts around here come tomorrow 45 cloudy now breezy too with an east northeast wind at 16. we'll be steady in the 40s this evening again we see the showers start to come to an end clouds linger through the remainder of the evening but the rain is going to start to pick back up as that major storm system lifts our way a whole lot of rain, some of it heavy, some big-time gusty winds on the way. We'll time that up, and following this thing, a major pattern change toward cooler. We'll step you through it all ahead of my weather authority forecast. All right, John, thank you so much. A home in Pierce Township is turning heads tonight after its owner makes a bold statement against local authorities. Local 12's at Plymouth spoke with the, Plymouth spoke with the man, as well as police, about the eye-popping paint job. Let it fall. Mike Wiggins is anything but bashful. It didn't fall out of the sky and land in my lap, that's for damn sure. <laughs> and he certainly isn't shy when it comes to airing his grievances. Everybody should be responsible for their actions. Period. But the way he chose to address an ongoing dispute with Pierce Township police, administrators, and neighbors is quickly becoming the talk of the town. Oh, what's your reaction to that? Now he's really trying to send a message to something. No, I, I want to know the story now. So it's like somebody's abusing some authority. Somebody knows somebody. It's just not fair. Wiggins says he's being harassed by police and zoning officials. He was cited for trespassing. The neighbors have reported him several times for excessive noise. I got agriculture, but I get a ticket for loud music. Not for shooting but for loud music. Pierce Township Police Chief Paul Brockstroman, whose name is prominently displayed on the facade of Wiggins' home, says that's not true. Neighbors are making calls about excessive gunfire. You know, he said he's hunting coyotes, but he's firing off 25 to 50 rounds at a time. And it appears to me that he's just trying to agitate his neighbors. How does it feel to see your name plastered up on that big white house? 
Well, um, it's the first time this has happened in my 35 years uh, in law enforcement. No, I feel bad for him because I think he thinks he's trying to do the right thing when he's the one that's drawing the focus on himself. With all respect to the police department and everything, I don't, I'm tired of the police being called every time I shoot and hunt when they know it's me, and that's my right. So either let the authority stop this picking on me and tell these people that keeps calling the police and keeps harassing me on everything I'm doing. You leave me alone, please. So Wiggins is also involved in an ongoing zoning dispute because of a cabin that he built there on his property. He also says one of his neighbors has security cameras set up on the property line, all facing his land, which he says is an invasion of his privacy. As for what, if any violations he committed with that new paint job on his house, Chief Roxerman says he's been in contact with the Pierce Township Zoning Department to answer that very question. Wiggins tells us he's in the process of trying to sell his home, but says he does still plan to live somewhere else inside his 27-acre property. A local college fails to pay students hundreds of thousands of dollars in financial aid. So I have here tonight at 6 what the U.S. Department of Education is doing to hold the college accountable and why faculty members argue it's still not enough. For months we've been following one man's journey in a shot of survival. I'm Liz Gomez. What if the only shot you couldn't find might be the one that saves your life? His amazing story coming right up. Support for this program comes from neighborhood Kroger stores. Kroger believes in providing customers with fresh food and the ability to personalize their individual shopping on the Kroger app or in store. Kroger, fresh for everyone. <sighs> Support for WMKV comes from the Real Estate Investors Association of Cincinnati, a nonprofit community of real estate investors with programs available for all levels of experience. More information about RIA and their meetings is available at 513-407-3137 or at CincinnatiREIA.com. Listening to the simulcast of the 12 News at 6 from Local 12 on 89.3 FM WMKV and 89.9 FM WLHS. Coming to you from the Kerber Mashburn Family Studio. It's a chilly and damp 45 degrees at 609. Stay tuned. We have Business Wise coming up. Business Wise is hosted by Tom Cooney and Crystal Faulkner. There with Cherry Becker tonight. They will be talking to Tom Rastani and they will be talking about keeping in touch with change. He's with the uh, Modern Messaging and that's coming up. Then we follow that with Mike Worth's Kaleidoscope, this one covering William Penn. Taking a look at traffic right now, obviously Vine between 4th and East 5th is still closed. It's been that way for a week. 275 northbound, the off ramp to the 74 exit, that ramp is closed due to an accident there. Club Pike between Batavia Road and Turpin Hills Drive is closed completely due to an accident. 75 north of the Hopkins Street exit, there's an accident. The two right lanes are blocked. That's a big issue there. Congress Avenue north of Springfield Pike, an accident there. Affected shoplifter is accused of firing a shot when he's confronted by store security. This happened this morning at the Kroger in Spring Grove Village. Police say 44-year-old Philip Dyke pulled out the gun after security approached him in the parking lot. After firing the gun, he ran and was found later at a car dealership across from the store. Dyke is charged with felonious assault criminal damaging and discharging a gun in a place where guns are prohibited. The U.S. Department of Education says it is doing more to hold a local college accountable for allegedly failing to distribute federal student aid funds. The U.S. Department of Education claims that Union Institute and University based in Walnut Hills failed to pay students $750,000 in federal financial aid. Now the U.S. Department of Education has blocked its access to federal student aid. It's also started the process to fine the school nearly $4.3 million. Faculty member Karina Smith says they haven't heard updates from the college's president, Dr. Karen Webb. She says more needs to be done to help faculty and students. The system is, is very disheartening for me and for literally hundreds of other people, staff, faculty, students. Union's termination of federal student aid funds and the fine will be final on November 27th unless Union plans to fight it. Some good news for you tonight. Three Cincinnati brothers get billionaire Mark Cuban to invest in their product after making their pitch on the show Shark Tank. David, Henry, and Flet Fletcher Pease created a company that makes augmented reality goggles for action sports like skiing. The Business Courier reports 
The snow goggles can help skiers find friends on the slopes, check their speed, control music, and even get notifications and answer calls. The brothers made their pitch last Friday. They scored a $300,000 investment in exchange for a 12.5% stake in their company. That is a cool story Ooh, right there. Congratulations to them. them. Yeah. More than a dozen medicines used to treat people with cancer are in short supply right now. Just ahead, one man's journey to find treatment after his current therapy no longer worked. New plans to build luxury townhouses in a local neighborhood. Coming up tonight at 11, the positive changes developers are hoping the new houses could bring there to the West End. Preparing students as the auto industry moves forward, the future now, how the new program rather is going to provide training to work on electric vehicles on Local 12 News Live at 11. Support comes from Cherry Beckert a large regional firm providing services and expertise to private and publicly held businesses, not-for-profits, small businesses, and individuals across the region. They offer... was a terrible shell. Huge cluster. Go to this shell again.
especially your starting quarterback. She sent it to the state's Health and Human Services Commission. She hasn't heard back. Every time you kind of hit roadblock, okay, there must be someone else that I can talk to if you can't help me. Risha had stumbled into a pitfall of medical billing that many people don't know about. Research shows when you get your blood work done at hospitals, they tend to charge way more than a doctor's office or an independent lab. In Texas, one study found it can be six times as expensive. And then when the hospital submitted the claim to her insurance, they called it a diagnostic test, even though this kind of blood work would usually be considered preventive, meaning there should be no cost to patients under federal law. A day after Bill of the Month contacted the hospital, the hospital zeroed out the bill, although it didn't respond to detailed questions about the charges. But Risha says that doesn't solve the underlying problem. Why was it so hard for her to fight the charge by herself? That's not okay. I mean, patient care doesn't end at the doctor's office. It continues. It includes insurance companies. It includes the billing department and all the behind the scenes stuff. Um, and that has a big impact on, you know, whether or not patients choose to seek care again. For Risha, the whole experience has made her more cautious. And she's going to pause and do more research, look for other lab options. Next time, she needs to get blood work done. For NPR News, I'm Emily Seiner. We're back with Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal. Dr. Rosenthal, what an outrageous story. I'm infuriated just listening to it. Why are bills sometimes so much more expensive when patients get blood tests at a hospital than at a doctor's office or an independent lab? Yeah, and what a battle she fought. I often say that blood tests at a hospital are akin to booze at restaurants. The markup can be much higher than you'd expect almost anything. Hospitals will often say they have to charge more because they're covering the overhead of maintaining their entire facility, like their ICUs. But that kind of cost shifting, even if you buy into it, really doesn't justify the price patients end up paying. So something like a simple blood count test that costs about $6 at a standalone lab could cost 60 at a hospital. And is there any pushback, any move to change that? Kind of. Lawmakers know it's a problem, and there are a couple of proposals in Congress that are designed to lower some hospital prices. The idea is to set a site-neutral policy, so the cost for a service provided to a patient is the same regardless of the setting where the care is gotten. But hospitals, of course, don't like that idea. It takes away revenue, and some are lobbying to keep things the same. Well, in the meantime, is there any way for a patient to make sure they don't experience what Risha experienced, that they don't get charged $2,000 for blood work? Well, what I love about this kind of outrageous bill is that, yes, there is something patients can do to avoid them. If your doctor is in a hospital, or even if her office is affiliated with a hospital, their computer is likely programmed to send test orders to the hospital lab. So what patients can do and what I always do when I see my primary care doctor is to ask that the request be sent to a commercial lab that's in your network, like LabCorp or Quest. And if they can't do it electronically, ask for one of those old-fashioned paper request forms. You may have to walk or drive a few blocks, but it'll be worth it for the hundreds or even thousands you'll save. Annoying, but maybe potentially necessary. Good advice from Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal there. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have a confusing or outrageous medical bill that you want us to review, please go to NPR's SHOTS blog and tell us all about it. The World Health Organization says 28 premature babies have been evacuated to Egypt from Gaza. They had survived for days outside incubators in Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza when the hospital was without power and then besieged by Israeli troops. Israel says Hamas uses the hospital for cover. NPR's producer in Gaza, Anna Spaba, met the mother of two of those babies as she waited by an ambulance to leave Gaza with her daughters. NPR's Ruth Sherlock reports. Laura Bamba's twin daughters, Lean and Bayan, were born prematurely three days before the Israeli offensive on Gaza, offensive on Gaza began. They were transferred without her to Gaza's biggest hospital, Al Shifa, and Vanna tells NPR producer Anas Baba when the airstrikes began, she wasn't able to reach them. By that time, Israel had Gaza under blockade during the offensive, it says, is aimed at preventing Hamas from committing more attacks like the one on October 7th and rescue hostages. With fuel and power shortages, the hospital incubators and ventilators stopped working, and the Gaza Ministry of Health says in the days before the babies could be reached, eight died. 
Bella says she didn't know if her daughters were still alive. But then she recognized them in a video sent out by a nurse and she was able to reunite with them today. She sat in an ambulance beside her baby girls who were all bundled under blankets and in blue fleece hats about to cross to Egypt. NPR producer Alice Baba was there. So she told me that this is the first time to see them. I want to hug them, I want to kiss them, I, I, I want to like to really cuddle them tightly. But I cannot, I cannot even touch them because they, uh, I do believe this is going to be like a hygienic and maybe that's going to be give them any disease. He says the most she could do was put out her finger when one of the babies raised her hand and held on to it tightly. It was phenomenal, the look on her face. It just like the mother that finally became a 100% mom with the touch of her child. There were four other premature babies in the ambulance, and Banna said she will help care for them too. Only a few mothers were with the 28 babies sent to Egypt today, with medics still trying to reach some of the parents, or even find out if they're still alive. Ruth Sherlock, NPR News. And this is NPR News. Support comes from the one. Black can tell when a video is real, or fabricated by artificial intelligence. Researchers are building defenses to protect your face and voice from so-called deep fakes. It scrambles the signal such that it prevents the AI from generating an effective copycat. Outfaking deep fakes tomorrow on Morning Edition from NPR News. Merchants celebrating 50 years of serving the greater Cincinnati area. Their knowledgeable staff can help you select the wines to pair with your Thanksgiving feast. You can experience the Wine Merchant's Ultimate Wine Station anytime with 16 different wines to taste before you buy. Shop in store or online at winemerchantcincinnati.com. Support comes from Paper Wings, locally owned, offering curated paper goods of all kinds, cards, mm -hmm. gifts, stationery products, pens, journals, and local art on paper. Paper Wings will deliver purchases within the 275 loop, located at 1207 Vine Street in Over the Rhine. More information at shoppaperwings.com. Marketplace is supported by Charles Schwab. Schwab believes every investor deserves to work with a firm they can count on, with financial consultants ready to serve clients and 24-7 live help. Hey, Chad GPT, define corporate hot mess for me, would you? From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by Cornerstone, whose AI-powered talent experience platform helps organizations unite tech, data, and content to unlock the potential of their future. Got the Costco out of the way. Now I'm going home.
that he just saw what happened. He's when the Green Caucus decides to oust the Speaker. The House floor was paralyzed. It was chaos. And Republicans were getting terrible headlines week after week because of it. Mm -hmm. And so, while in the interim, they've made clear that they're going to try to make his life harder, that they're going to try to punish him in all these small ways, I do think there's a possibility where, at the end of the day, if Johnson is able to keep the job, it's not necessarily going to be because the Freedom Caucus is so thrilled with how he's doing. It would be because they essentially can't bear dethroning another speaker. Well, Katie, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. Katie Edmondson covers Congress for the New York Times. The Daily is supported by Payoneer, helping businesses pay their global contractors and suppliers wherever they are. Learn more at Payoneer.com. And by Baird, employee-owned Baird offers financial advice focused on clients' needs without the distraction of outside shareholders. More at BairdDifference.com. For everything you need to know about the most important stories of the day, you're listening to The Daily, distributed by American Public Media. The Daily is powered by the journalism of The New York Times and is distributed by APM, American Public Media. You can go deeper into the stories you hear on The Daily at nytimes.com slash The Daily. That's it for The Daily. I'm not going to lie. Good evening, it's 7.30, and Today Explained is coming up next here on WVXU or WMUV. That's followed at 8 o'clock by Cincinnati Edition Encore when the, uh, with a discussion of the legal implications of the passage of Ohio Issue 1 plus movie and streaming recommendations. All that on Cincinnati Edition Encore coming up at 8 o'clock on WVXU and WMUV. Stay with us. Support comes from the Cincinnati Pops, presenting Holiday Pops, December 8th through 10th in Music Hall. It's the most wonderful time of the year with JMR and the Pops. Music Hall will be decked out as choruses, dancers, and Queen City favorite, Capathia Jenkins, brings holiday classics to life. Tickets at CincinnatiPops.org. The season sponsor for BMC. How do you wake up in the morning? Do you bounce out of bed or do you hit that snooze button a few times? This is Mary Ann Selesnick and no matter what your ritual, I'll be with you getting you ready for the day with local news, traffic, and weather. Plus NPR's Morning Edition a 91.7 WVXU. WVXU goes wherever you do. Listen to 91.7 online at iHeartRadio.com and on your mobile device through the iHeartRadio app. Since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, the eyes of the world have been on Gaza, understandably. But another front in this conflict is the West Bank, which is a kidney bean-shaped piece of land on the West Bank of the Jordan River. Palestinians live in the West Bank alongside Jewish settlers, people who've pushed into the area seeking land and housing, who've built cities, and who believe they have a right to be there, even though most of the international community has condemned their settlements as illegal. Some settlers violently attack the Palestinians living there with impunity, and since this war began, those attacks have gotten bad enough for the eyes of the world to occasionally leave Gaza and look to the West Bank. I continue to be alarmed about extremist settlers attacking Palestinians in the West Bank. That uh, pouring gasoline on fire is what this is like. Ahead on Today Explained. Support comes from the Kamuni Missionaries, presenting the 76th Annual Nativity Experience. This December, you can view one-of-a-kind nativity displays from more than a dozen countries and enjoy shopping in the Mission Market and Christmas Boutique at Kamboni's Anderson Center. Open to the public. Full details, including days, times, at kambonimissionaries.org. I ask Scott Worsley, Chief Economics Correspondent at NPR. You've probably heard the price of used vehicles is way up from a year ago. 
Maybe you've been tempted to sell that old car that you're not using anymore for some extra cash. But consider this, that car is also worth more in terms of financial support than this public radio station. So if you don't need it, why not donate it? Thanks. To donate your car, go to WBXU.org. The way is to give. Good evening at 7.33. This is 91.7 WBXU on Pound Temple. Most of the earlier traffic incidents have cleared out. One remains a wreck. It's an overturned truck blocking the ramp 275 northbound. The off-ramp to westbound I-74 is blocked due to that overturned truck. A low of 47 with rain heavy at times and gusty winds tonight. 45 degrees now in Cincinnati. This is today explained. My name is Nathan Prawl. So for a decade I've worked with an organization called the International Crisis Group, which is a conflict prevention organization that works in some dozens of conflict areas all over the world. And I was in charge of Israel-Palestine managing a small team in the West Bank, Gaza, and Israel. Nathan is the author of a new book called A Day in the Life of Abed Salama about a Palestinian father from the West Bank searching for his son who's gone missing after a bus accident. The book tells some of the history of Israeli settlements in the West Bank and illustrates why Israel faces mighty criticism for its support of settlers, not just from Palestinians, but also from some Israelis and from the international community. I asked Nathan to start by telling us what the West Bank looks like and who lives there. The West Bank is uh, quite hilly. It has a mountain ridge running through uh, the middle of it, north to south. And it is covered with Israeli settlements. And these settlements in the popular imagination are a set of caravans haphazardly erected on a hilltop. But in fact, they are towns and cities that look identical to the communities of similar size within Israel proper. And they are connected seamlessly, seamlessly to Israel proper. The residents of these communities include Israel's elite. They include uh, Supreme Court justices. They include ministers in the Israeli government and many, many other uh, government employees and leaders in um, industry. And these people are able to live in these communities precisely because they have been segregated from the Palestinian population that surrounds them. And they have been given uh, roads that uh, cut through these Palestinian communities without having exits or entrances for the Palestinian communities that these highways pass through. And this whole architecture, this infrastructure, gives the residents, the Jewish residents of these settlements, the illusion that they are living in a Jewish-only zone where they don't really have to confront or think about the Palestinians who are uh, just beside them. And they can go very easily to their workplaces in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem and believe that they are living in a suburb just like any other. How long have the settlements, the Israeli settlements, been in the West Bank? The settlement project began really as soon as Israel conquered the West Bank in East Jerusalem. In the years that followed the war in 1967, Israeli civilians, settlers, started moving into the West Bank. They are the children of Ofra, a new settlement of 40 Jewish families on what once was Arab land. Those settlements were created by the Israeli center-left that had been in power since the establishment of the state in 1948 and remained in power until 1977. So for the first decade of the settlement project, it was driven by uh, center-left governments. And uh, it's important to stress, it was driven by the government. This is not a story of a bunch of radicals twisting the arm of the state against its will, which is how it's often depicted. This is a state-driven project, and it is, in fact, the greatest project, the largest and most expensive project that the state of Israel has undertaken. And so, as the settlers have moved in, 
how have they justified this? There are a number of different uh, motivations for moving to the settlements. Broadly speaking, there are three groups of settlers. There are ideologically driven settlers who believe that the West Bank is the historic homeland of the Jewish people and that they have every right to uh, build homes and establish Israeli sovereignty in these areas, no less so than Israel had a right to establish uh, settlements in 78% of historic Palestine, the borders of Israel prior to 1967. And this is an argument that they make to their detractors in Israeli politics. The second type of settler is just an ordinary uh, middle class or uh, upper middle class person who is moving there because there are financial incentives to do so. You can have a nicer home, a larger home, a less expensive home, and because it has all been set up in a way that makes it painless to live there and gives you the sense that this is really no different than any other suburb, members of the middle class do move there. And what happens over time is they often start to shift ideologically after moving there because every human being naturally wants to feel justified in what they're doing. And the third type are ultra-Orthodox Jews, and they historically had avoided living in settlements, but that uh, changed, and they live in a few settlements, but they're very large and uh, dense, and those settlements are, for the most part, closer to the edge of the West Bank, closer to the boundary with pre-1967 Israel. How do Palestinian and Jewish residents of the West Bank interact with each other? Do they interact with each other typically? The Palestinian and uh, Jewish communities in the West Bank are entirely segregated, and the settlements have uh, gates at their entrances and uh, security guards at those gates, mm. and Palestinians are not allowed to enter them unless they are coming as... Uh, pre-approved workers uh, as cleaners or uh, gardeners or construction workers. That's the uh, degree of segregation that exists in uh, the West Bank. Okay, so this is a highly unequal situation. If you are Palestinian in the West Bank, you are subject to restrictions. You are subject to inequities. But then on top of that, Nathan, we hear about settler violence. What does this refer to? What does that mean? So settler violence is a broad term that includes everything from settlers going and burning down uh, all the trees of uh, Palestinians who live uh, nearby. It includes uh, raids on Palestinian communities in the middle of the night. It includes activities that Israeli officials even have referred to as pogroms, such as the burning of uh, all kinds of property in the town of Hawara earlier this year, or in the town of Tormus Aya last June. Dozens of settlers came here. They tried to enter the courtyard, and they set cars on fire. They started shooting towards the house using live bullets and stones, and they broke the balconies. The Palestinians who are attacked are entirely defenseless in this situation. They know that if they lay a single finger on an armed settler who enters their home, they can be arrested and put in jail and locked up in what is known as administrative detention, which is detention without trial or charge. Israel can do that for six months to somebody and then extend it indefinitely. It's uh, unbelievable that people spending years and years under administrative detention with no charges. They don't know why, they don't know for how long. And so when a Palestinian encounters a settler militia, they know that putting their finger on that settler 
is not putting their hand on an individual. It's putting their hand on the entire state of Israel. This enormous machine that controls their every movement and that can arrest them and their family members at any moment. How is it that the settlers can commit such violence without legal repercussions? Where does the law fit in here? The law doesn't fit in here because there is total impunity for the settlers. When there are uh, cases filed against settlers for attacks on Palestinians, fewer than 10% result in an indictment and only 3% result in a conviction. That's uh, data from the last 18 years. And now, after October 7th, when most of the regular army is off uh, in Gaza or on the border with Lebanon, you have those same settlers who were attacking the Palestinian communities several months ago, now in uniform, with full authority to do those same attacks as the army. We know that there will be an end in Gaza. We don't know what it is. And it sounds as though the Netanyahu government and the international community are actively debating, discussing what the end in Gaza will look like. But in the West Bank, it seems as though there is no end in mind. How do you envision this playing out? Where do you think this is all leading, Nathan? No matter...